Good morning, everybody. I want you to keep me in prayer. Today, exactly, is 27 years since I was ordained. So it's the 27th anniversary, and and what a journey it has been. But I am also asking you to keep India in your prayers right now. Have you read the news? It is awful right now. I think they got very complacent, gave up all the good habits. There were elections that recently happened in four states, and here we have. Uh, so it's crazy. My mom just got her second shot today, the vaccine shot, so hopefully um, the elderly will, but a lot of people have died. This is the highest anywhere in the world right now, so please keep the country in your prayers, and my family as well. So recently, I acquired some baby chickens. And note that I'm not saying I acquired chicks. That would not be good headlines. <laughs> Priest acquires 10 chicks. That simply is not good. <laughs> now, I figured it would be better to spend money on a hobby than on therapy. It's very stressful these days. Nevertheless, taking care of these chicks has been very interesting. Besides feeding them, I have to make sure that I take them out during the day when it is warm and bring them back in during the night when it is cold. The first day I put them outside, there were three hawks circling the coop. And of course, my biggest challenge is to protect them from yet another fierce predator, sweet little Tutu. She's having a really, really rough time. See, you see, all my life I've taught her to fetch. And now she cannot understand why I'm not allowing her to fetch these chicks. She's going nuts. Now, since I got the baby chickens, I have been given some interesting pseudonames. Somebody called me a chicken tender the other day. <laughs> By the way, that's not the real name for someone who takes care of chickens. It's called poulterer or a chicken farmer. That's the right word. It's neither chicken tender nor chick magnet. <laughs> neither of the two. Okay? That's awesome. <laughs> I'm a poulterer these days. But Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. As a shepherd. No ordinary shepherd. Good shepherd. And Jesus could have described himself in many other ways keeping the messianic expectation in mind. He could have called himself the great warrior or he could have called himself the king. But he does not. He calls himself the shepherd. And perhaps the reason Jesus uses the imagery of the shepherd is because it's the most prominent and consistently used image for God in the Old Testament. Right from the book of Genesis, all the way through the historical books, through wisdom literature and in the prophetic literature, the most prominent image of God is God as the shepherd. Who can forget that great psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. The imagery also served well for the Palestinian people because they were an agricultural people. And the imagery was taken right out of their daily life. Probably there were sheep in every household, most households. First of all because uh, it was food. But then every Passover a family was to take an unblemished lamb and sacrifice it. Sheep was the most commonly sacrificed animal in the temple. But perhaps the most important reason that Jesus uses the image of the shepherd is because he found that the people were like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus grieves over that. There were shepherds, but they were like a hired man who is not a shepherd. Jesus, on the contrary, is the good shepherd. And he's the good shepherd because he lays down his life for the sheep. 
So, based on three sentences from today's gospel reading, three of Jesus' words, I want to draw three practical implications for each one of us. First, I know mine and mine know me. Folks, the chicks that I recently acquired already recognize me. Well, this is surprising to me, but the moment they see Tutu running towards them, they run and hide in the coop. But if I go alone, they don't, because they know I come with either food or water. And to a certain extent, I have come to know them too. I know that they like grated carrots, but they don't like grated zucchini. My chickens have taste. And yes, I do great vegetables for my chickens. No matter how much my chickens know me, and I know these chickens, they will never have a relationship with me. At no point are they going to tell me, I love you, Papa Tish. No. And I can't promise you that they won't adorn my table someday. But this intimate relationship between the shepherd and the sheep is what is important for Jesus. I know mine and mine know me. The good shepherd cares for the sheep, provides for them, protects them, tends to them, but most importantly loves them and knows them. And the expectation is that the sheep will also know the shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd who knows us. So this week, may I ask you to take some time apart and reflect on your relationship with the shepherd. The invitation from the shepherd is to know him, to hear his voice, to follow his commands, but most of all, to love him. So may I please ask you to take and set some time aside to evaluate the relationship with the Good Shepherd and see if the dynamic that the Good Shepherd is providing us is being fulfilled by us as the flock. That's my first point. Secondly, Jesus says, I will lay down my life for the sheep. The image of a sheep being sacrificed for a greater good is a very prominent one in the Old Testament. So the sheep is sacrificed sometimes as a sin offering, right? So the, sa the, so the lamb sacrifices its life so that a greater good is accomplished, the forgiveness of sins. Now, even if the shepherd knew the sheep, loved them, cared for them, protected them, a day would come when the sheep would either become food or a temple sacrifice. Jesus is the good shepherd because he changes this dynamic. Instead of the sheep being sacrificed, the shepherd lays down his life. Jesus the good shepherd says, I will lay down my life for the sheep. And so the good shepherd becomes the food and the sacrifice. As John says in today's first reading, second reading, see what love the Father has bestowed on us that we may be called the children of God. And why? Because the shepherd in the shepherd's sacrificial love has sacrificed his life instead of the sheep. And so the sacrificial love of the shepherd is the key here. If Jesus could lay down his life for the sheep, I hope that we who listen to his voice can learn from him. And again, what's the key? The key is self-sacrificial love. If you take nothing from this homily, folks, today, take that with you. Self-sacrificial love. For example, 
the correlation between self-sacrificial love and the quality of family life needn't even be debated. If everybody in the family gives of themselves with the same self-sacrificial love that Jesus does, the effect on the family is simply obvious. We don't have to debate that. Similarly, the greater the self-giving from everyone at work, the greater the contentment and productivity. But even one person can ruin it all. The more we care for the earth, the more we give to the earth, the more the earth is going to give back to us. The more we sacrifice for the common good, the more society will be at peace and in harmony. So as we live our daily lives, may the love that the Father has bestowed on us and the self-sacrificial love of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life for us, be our model. Please take that home to your workplaces, to society. And finally, Jesus says there will be one flock and one shepherd. In the Jewish messianic expectation, one of the roles of the Messiah was to unite the Jewish people. It was to bring everybody together. But Jesus does not limit the flock only to the Jewish people. He says, I have other sheep that do not belong to the fold. Jesus is the good shepherd not just for the Jewish people but for the whole world. In fact, Jesus laid down his life not only for the Jewish people but for the whole world. The hope is that the outside world would be drawn into the fold because of the of Jesus' self-gift to the world. So Jesus gives himself to the world and in return the hope is that people would come and become part of the one flock. But folks today tragically the world is anything but one. There is one shepherd but even the community of believers is divided. Even Catholics are not united as a people who have one shepherd. And this is a tragedy. When it comes to oneness and unity, perhaps you feel as helpless as I do. Yesterday, truly, my whole day was feeling tremendous amount of frustration for what we can be and what we refuse to be. We do not have control over the affairs of the world or of the church. We may not be able to control things beyond our ability, but as individuals, surely we can try to not create or contribute to the disunity. That we can control. That is within our control. I think the biggest step that we can take is to focus on our common humanity rather than focus on the differences. And really, I think that is the key for us who are trying to, to be countercultural uh, to that extent. To focus on that which is common among us. And I'm thinking there are three things that are common. First of all, we are all human beings. We are all God's children, not just Catholics, not just Christians, not just the Jewish people, but the whole world. Every human person is a human person created in the image and likeness of God and is a child of God. That is what is common. Can we focus on that? Secondly, we all come from God and we must all return to God. Our origin and our destiny is the same. For all of us here and everybody in the world, can we focus on that? And thirdly, we all have the same command to love God and to bestow on one another the same love that the Father has bestowed on us. Can we do that? If we can do this, then we will do our part so that there might be one shepherd, one flock. Let us join hands with Jesus to fulfill his dream of there being one flock 
and one shepherd. As we celebrate this Eucharist, folks, let's remember we are not sheep. We are God's children. Let us be God's people, united with Christ in His mission. People of God said,